think I could shit where I eat. She started on the stage, but now Adura Anashile is bringing depth, nuance and suspense to contemporary drama as a director. With theatre and now film projects under her belt, Anashile is also giving voice to the unheard stories from black British history. She joins us to tell us more. Adura, hi. Thanks for being with us. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, your film is called Expensive Shit, and it started its life as an award-winning play at the Edinburgh Fringe before you adapted it for the screen, and it's now showing at the Glasgow Short Film Festival. I don't want to reveal the dramatic arc just yet, but the story does focus on Tola, a Nigerian woman working in a Scottish nightclub. But just in terms of shifting the action from stage to screen, what possibilities did film open up for you in the telling of the story? I mean... Uh, film is a visual medium and so I could tell the story uh, with less dialogue and more visually and I think because of the setting of the of the uh, of the story and I don't want to give away all of it but but there's uh, the setting means that visually it's it can be it's really potent um and so I was able to shift from dialogue based uh, uh, um, which is what I had to do in theater really, to make sense of the play, to being much sparser on dialogue in the film and really tightening in on visuals and telling the story visually. Um, and I think the dilemma the character Tolu finds herself in lends itself to that quite well. Indeed. Well, let's get a closer look. Here is a clip of the film. exactly what you showed me, but I can never get it right. Hey, you feel better. You think of everything. Adura, you mentioned there that Tola finds herself faced with a moral dilemma, and that does seem complicated by a certain power dynamic between characters. What did you want to say about the relationships between those people? I think I was um, fascinated by layers of exploitation. I think often when we think about exploitation, we, we kind of um, take away people's agency and we think it's quite black and white, but actually the systems that are in place are layered and, um, and oppressive, especially because they're layered. And we hear the word inter intersectionality talked about a lot now, and I kind of approached making the film a bit like that, that actually the pressures on my central character come from various systems around her, and she's forced to act, or she feels that she, she, she can't help but act in a particular way because of the way those pressures kind of um, bear down on her. So for me, I guess, uh, it's interesting in, in the film because I, I'm not into sort of good and bad black and white characters. I think that um, that we are all capable of acting in certain ways if we're put in certain situations. And that's what I'm interested in um, in exploring. I quite like audiences to be conflicted about characters and conflicted about stories. Um, so, yeah. That word nuance comes to mind again. Now, the issue of sexual assault does feature in your film, and it is tragically part of the national conversation right now in the UK uh, with the recent disappearance of Sarah Everard in London. Now, how do you see the discourse around sexual violence playing out in the arts? How do you think cultural representations are contributing to that? I mean, I, I think the first thing is that we're not talking about it enough. We're not talking about the ways that women might feel unsafe enough. And I don't mean just when you're walking home alone. I mean, um, I feel like there's a gamut of 
um, situations where women can feel like there's a power dynamic. And I mean women in all senses. And I think that what we need to do is have that conversation. You know, often we think that assault has to be at the worst end of assault. And if people are not doing that, then they're fine. But I'm really interested in, um, in the things that we don't think are problematic but actually could be on the journey towards making women feel unsafe. Now, we spoke there of a change from stage to screen, but another shift when it comes to medium for you is your most recent theatre project, Ghosts. The drama mm -hmm. takes place in the form of an immersive tour through the streets of Glasgow, and it practically whispers the city's history into our ears. Let's get a feel for it with this clip. I am Glasgow. I am your workers, your baileys, your Lord Provost and your tobacco merchants. Point your cameras. Look up, look around. There I am. So we heard from a young man there in 18th century Glasgow. He's the protagonist of the piece, and he's one of the voices of the slave trade that historically we've not heard. Was it that silence that inspired you? How did you come to create this story and that character? I think, uh, firstly, it's important to say I love Glasgow, and one of the, the first things I loved about the city was the architecture. I don't know if you've been there, but the architecture in Glasgow is stunning, and there's nowhere in the UK quite like it. And when I first came here, I, I fell in love with it. And as I delved into where this grandeur came from, I realized that a lot of these buildings were built in the 17th and 18th century, and they were built as a direct result of the gains of the slave trade. Um, and there is a part of Glasgow called Merchant City, and it's literally called Merchant City because it's named after the tobacco merchants. Now, of course, the tobacco merchants had plantations in the Caribbean and in the Americas. When you walk around Glasgow, you see Jamaica Street, you see all these different streets that, that have the, this connection. So my attempt in coming up with this character was to kind of ask the question, if historically we have a blind spot about our history, how does it affect how we see ourselves in the present? Is there something incomplete about us? And I wanted to explore a character who kind of does this. He's sort of fragmented. He's he's then and now. He's like, he's mercurial. He can be in 20 places at once. And his vantage point is a kind of um, exploration of this question of us denying this history and what it costs us to deny this history. Well, indeed, that piece brings up issues that some UK institutions have been dealing with in recent years, race, colonialism and the legacy of empire. We spoke to Jackie Wiley, director of Scotland's National Theatre, about the commissioning of this piece. Here's more from her. We're a national theatre that is really, really proud to be able to articulate a version of Scotland that's very forward-looking and very contemporary. And in something like Ghosts, we're looking to the past of Scotland, but the reason that we're looking to the past is so that we can understand who we are in the present and we can understand a really complex version of Scotland in the moment so that we can all go forward as a as a Scottish nation. Social change is about addressing issues of power and inequality and um, searching and striving for for a society that, that everybody's valued in an equal way. And absolutely, our institutions have a part to play in addressing those really important issues. Now, Jackie mentions inequality there, and it's something that's being addressed in Scottish institutions. The University of Aberdeen has said they'll return a bronze sculpture to Nigeria after it was acquired by British soldiers more than a century ago in, quote, reprehensible circumstances. Glasgow University is also going to pay millions of pounds into a restorative justice scheme because of its historical links to the slave trade. That has set them apart from certain attitudes in England, for example. Adora, do you think the English will follow suit? I have no idea. I, I think that the cost to England might be um, 
uh, a lot harder or a lot a, a lot costly. I don't even know what the right word is. I don't think England is ready to make the shifts that Scotland is currently making. I would say that, yeah. Mm. Now, to wrap up our show, we asked you for a recommendation from the world of arts and culture, and you pointed us to fellow British filmmaker well, who was an artist as well, uh, Steve McQueen, and his recent series of films, Small Acts. Tell us why they left such a strong impression. In particular, Lover's Rock, um, which was one of the five films. So if people don't know, these five films deal with different aspects of institutional inequality in British society. Um, and Lover's Rock was very much focused on the Lover's Rock genre of music and of dancing. And what Steve McQueen does with this film is quite phenomenal as far as I'm concerned. And I can't believe it was on primetime television because not a lot happens in terms of plot, but he's, he stays, the camera lingers on people. It lingers in the middle of the dance floor. There's almost a kind of, um, uh, there's a, almost a kind of a real time quality to it. And to experience that in an hour and a half film in this day and age when everything is so fast and we think that we're obsessed with story and the story moving constantly forward to get something like Lover's Rock, to see it work so beautifully because of its cinematography, because of the way he kind of, his production values was an absolute revelation to me. A glowing recommendation, Adora. Thank you so much for the tip. And thanks for joining us today as well. We'll leave you with a clip of Small Axe, which is available on Prime Video or on the Salatil streaming platform here in France. Do remember to check out our website. We're on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this. They are not demoralized or defeated persons. They are leaders, but are rooted deep among those they lead. We mustn't be victims, but protagonists of our stories. Don't you think it's time things were different? As individuals, we have an impossible battle. As a collective, we stand a chance. If you are a big tree, we are the small X, sharpen to cut you down. Sidi Bouzid, Tunisia, December 2010. A young fruit seller sets himself on fire. He feels ignored and abandoned by the government. His death stirs nationwide protests for democracy. It's the beginning of the Arab Spring. We went out to protest against the regime. We didn't think we were making a revolution. But when the regime fell, we had dreams. While Tunisians today enjoy freedom of expression, some are nostalgic for the dictatorship of President Ben Ali. We have security, a health system, safety, and a bit of freedom. Our reporters are in Sidi Bouzid, in a Tunisia caught between two stools. Have the achievements of the revolution met the dreams and expectations of the Tunisian people? Sidi Bouzid revisited all this week here on France 24.